Hello and welcome back to The Independent Pianist. I'm Cole Anderson. A few weeks back when I did a Q&A video, I got this comment. And I think the same commenter has been asking me for a while now if I will ever get around to doing a Liszt's B minor sonata. No fear, I am in fact going to do Liszt's B minor sonata at some point this summer. That's my plan at any rate. But I first wanted to cover this piece, which I consider to be kind of a companion piece, a spiritual companion piece, if you will, to the B minor sonata in many ways, and also one of Liszt's greatest works. So the Ballade in B minor, the second of Liszt's two Ballades for piano solo, is another one of these very few works that Liszt wrote, which just has a kind of generic title and no explicit program attached to it. As I'm sure you'll be aware, if you've looked at Liszt's works at all, or any of the pieces that I put on this channel, more often than not, Liszt would include a quotation from a poem or some kind of reference to a story, a legend, a painting, what have you. But here there's nothing. Uh, written in the music, at least. However, according to his students, or at least one of his students, there was a fairly well-known legend that Liszt actually had in mind when he wrote this piece, which is the story of Hero and Leander. Uh, we have this information from Claudio Orao, who got it from his teacher, Martin Krause, who was one of Liszt's later pupils. It was also supposedly common knowledge among Liszt's pupils that the Sonata in B minor also had a program that Liszt again, decided not to make public, which was some kind of imagining of the Faust story. All this is debatable, of course. Uh, we don't have a large body of a reference for any of this, but the story fits the music so well that it's actually quite plausible. Uh, the interesting thing is that actually this work was written during a period when Liszt wrote quite a few pieces with uh, generic titles and no program attached to them. You might have already even recognized the title Ballade uh, was used by another very famous romantic composer, namely Frédéric Chopin, whose four ballades for the piano are legendary and were much championed by Liszt during his career and also by his students later on. So right around when Liszt was working on this piece, and uh, it was also a similar time of period when he was finishing the sonata in B minor, the early 1850s, was also right about the time that he was working on his biography of Chopin. This was right after Chopin had died in 1849. And for a brief period, Liszt was actually writing a lot of pieces in genres that had been Chopin's. You know, when Chopin was alive, uh, Liszt really didn't write any ballades. But then he comes up with these two after Chopin's death. Also, there are the two Polonaises, a piece called the Mazurka Brilliant, a Bursus. Again, the only really well-known Bursus up to that time had been Chopin's. And then there's also the third constellation in D-flat major, which has more than a passing similarity to at least the opening of Chopin's famous Nocturne in D-flat major. And there definitely are passages in, in many of these works, particularly in the Mazurka and in the first Polonaise, which are very reminiscent of Chopin. They could almost have been composed by him. However, as a whole, these works all are very much original to Liszt. Even if he was inspired by Chopin in certain ways, these works do become very much his own kind of creation. And that's definitely the case with this ballad as well. I think the basic structural idea of this work is also very akin to Chopin's ballads because I see them as kind of a reaction to the legacy of the Viennese classical composers, particularly Beethoven. Uh, Beethoven is the one that you always look to because he was such an inspiring figure for the Romantics. His whole life and his whole kind of revolutionary aspect to his career was very inspiring to them. So there was this kind of problem for composers after Beethoven. How do you react to this incredible body of work that he left, the symphonies, the sonatas, the string quartets, which were such perfect expressions and such imaginative expressions of the idea of sonata form as it had been practiced up to that time. Well, some composers took more of the approach of just taking the next steps after Beethoven. I think that'd be someone like Brahms, who was basically working within those forms still and just trying to explore them in a slightly new way. On the other hand, with Chopin or with Liszt, you get composers who are trying to do something totally different, who are trying to transform these forms into something very new, while at the same time perhaps paying a kind of homage to the forms of the past. So I think you really get that in Chopin's Ballades, in these Ballades by Liszt, and also 
also in his sonata in B minor. We see kind of a respect for the old idea of the sonata form, but also an exploration of new territory. So I'll be kind of pointing this out as I go along, how you could almost see this blood in the style of an overture, a symphonic overture in sonata form. On the other hand, there's many qualities to it, like the very long themes and the kind of episodic nature of some of the construction, which is much more uh, reminiscent of Chopin's approach to this form as well. So besides these ideas from Beethoven and Chopin, there's another very obvious comparison which has to be made, which is to Wagner. In particular to one work by Wagner, his music drama Tristan and Isolde. There are connections between the literary material that is used for both works, if as long as we accept that Hero and Leander is in fact the inspiration for Liszt's second ballade. But there are also musical connections, thematic connections between the two works. In particular, there is this theme in Liszt's piece, which is obviously a kind of love theme, which you can draw a close connection to this other theme from Tristan. Wagner wrote Tristan later in the 1850s, so it was after Liszt's Ballade, and it seems clear to me that the musical language and the whole style of rhetoric in this piece was probably very inspiring for Wagner. Of course, it's hard to say how much uh, how these influences flow. Uh, Wagner had written, I think already at this point, uh, the theme for Brunhilde from the Ring Cycle, which goes kind of like this. So that's also a very similar kind of motive, so maybe these motives were kind of going back and forth between the two of them. Be that as it may, I think there is something very operatic about how the scenes in this story are kind of staged and filled out and explored in Liszt's music, which really reminds me of many passages from Wagner operas. And that seems to be the case much more so even than in Chopin's ballades, which oftentimes have a much more intimate feeling to them. In Liszt, there's a little bit more of a public, large-scale, extravagant nature to the way he explores many of the themes. It just so happens that this is also a time period when Liszt was working on his only mature opera, a setting of the uh, story of Sardanapalus, the death of Sardanapalus, which he never finished, actually. So maybe he was kind of in that frame of mind. This was also his period of being a conductor in Weimar and conducting a lot of premieres of Wagner operas. So maybe he was just in that kind of headspace at the, at the time as well. So another way in which this piece really is a companion piece to the B minor sonata is in this whole idea of transformation of themes. And the piece really is, in some ways, this is even more impressive than some of the thematic transformations which occur in the B minor sonata. This piece is all about transformation or even transfiguration, if you want to put it that way. All the themes are heard many, many times, but always in new guises, in new subtle transformations that really change the way that we feel this music emotionally. This piece has been criticized a lot in the past as being overly repetitive and overly rhetorical, bombastic, and so forth, but I think that's really unfair when you look at how carefully he crafts every recurrence of these important motives. So I'll give a little bit of a synopsis of the story as I lead you through the music and we can explore the piece together. Important thing to note first, Hero is the woman in this story. So don't get confused when I put in the score that the hero's theme, it's actually referring to a person. Hero used to be a very common name for, for a woman. So Hero is a priestess at the shrine of Aphrodite here in Sestos, whereas Leander lives across the strait in Abydos. So this strait was known uh, in ancient Greece as the Hellespont, and now we call it the Dardanelles. This is in northwest Turkey, kind of separating the European part of Turkey and the Asian part. So anyway, Hero and Leander meet for the first time at a festival to Aphrodite. Uh, Leander falls in love 
they both fall in love actually with each other. And some versions of the story say that it's because of their parents' opposition to their union that they have to meet in secret. So what happens? Leander at night swims from Abydos to Cestus and they meet at the shrine of Aphrodite. And in most versions of the myth, we get a full month that Leander safely swims to Hero each night during the summer when the sea is very calm. There are many, many settings of this myth, by the way. Uh, the most likely version that List would have known would probably have been Schiller's poem, which was in German, so it, it would make the most sense. But there are, are many, many fine settings of this, of this story that you can find. So the opening theme right away, we realize we're hearing the ocean at night. This pattern in the left hand with the chromatic scales, which is later going to become very important, is the waves as Leander is swimming along. And then we get another theme, which just happens to be in kind of a similar shape, actually. It has a rising and then a falling aspect to it, but it's in long notes and it's very rhetorical. And this is a very important theme which is going to come back again and again throughout the piece in many different guises. I correlate it to the implacable strength um, and power of the ocean and of nature in general. Uh, exactly what it represents is, of course, up to your own imagination, but that's just my, my take on it. And it's amazing how vivid the music really is. When we get to this passage, you can almost see and feel the struggle as Leander reaches shore and emerges from the water. Then we get these kind of very solemn chords, which could re represent many things. I actually read one comment on a YouTube video that uh, someone suggested that it could even be uh, supposed to set the words Ich liebe dich, I, I love you, first with Leander saying it and then in the higher setting with Hero replying. Or perhaps it's supposed to just represent the solemnity of the shrine when Leander arrives. At any rate, you can hear pretty clearly it's another variant of this opening motive, whatever it's supposed to represent. Then we get a very, very different theme. This is a theme based on arpeggio figures. It's in the major key, the major dominant in this case, F sharp major. And this is the theme, obviously, which represents hero. So again, there's a little bit of a feeling of sonata form being suggested here because we have two very contrasting melodic ideas and the key relationship is right too. So we have the dominant for the second theme. So again, he's kind of marking some moments from what we would consider to be a normal sonata form. It's also worth pointing out that this little turn figure at the end of Hero's theme is actually foreshadowing that love theme that I mentioned before. It has a very similar kind of shape to it. I also just love the way that Liszt extends this final cadence, so that penultimate chord there before the final resolution, for five whole beats, which you absolutely should count out exactly. It's like Hero can't bear 
to let Leandro go at this moment. It's so expressive and wonderful. And what else does he do? He repeats both of these themes again in pretty much exactly the same way. However, with one very significant difference, he lowers all the music by a half step. So we get the first time in B minor and F sharp major, the second time in B flat minor and F major. And this is certainly unheard of in a sonata form. You would not repeat the exposition, the first two contrasting themes, in a different key, let alone a half step lower, which is very, very weird sounding. It certainly would have been really weird sounding at that time, and even now it has kind of an odd, creepy feeling to it. Uh, Liszt does write some very subtle changes. He actually adds one extra little melodic turn in the first theme the second time around, and it's clear this is not a mistake. If you look at the manuscript, you can see that it's really pretty, pretty clear that he wanted to change this the second time. So reacting to that, I really think uh, reacting to the change of key and to this little alteration that Liszt has made, you shouldn't play the second time exactly the same as the first time. It should be a little bit more anxious, a little bit more uncertain. Uh, the, the sea is still calm, but there is this dark undercurrent here, and perhaps it is a little bit harder for Leander to reach shore this time. And then we get the third night. So in Liszt's version, we just get two peaceful nights, and then the third night is when things start to heat up. And the first thing we hear is something which is not very water-like at all. We hear these, it sounds like it would be played by trumpets or some kind of brass instrument, this little fanfare. this whole passage is supposed to represent a huge thunder and lightning storm. And then there's this later very striking passage where you have these triplet, repeated triplet motive gets repeated in the left hand, and you have a very intense kind of syncopation in the right hand. And so this is just my idea. I think that in this part, we're actually sensing Leander's internal turmoil as he's facing the danger of this huge storm at sea before he actually makes the plunge to swim across. And so then a little bit after this passage, we get a new motive, actually. It's kind of related to something that came before, but it's set now in broken octaves in the right hand. Obviously, this is a development of the opening chromatic motive that was supposed to represent the ocean, only expanded now. These broken octaves, by the way, are quite difficult to play well. You'll rarely see in piano writing in the 20th century uh, passages in broken octaves like this. It was actually quite common, though, in the 19th century, the 18th century, Beethoven wrote a lot of passages in broken octaves. Uh, it was a lot easier to play these on instruments that were very light in action. They become quite a bit more awkward on on modern pianos, which are significantly heavier. Uh, in some of the louder sections, in fact, later on in the piece, you might even find yourself playing them a little bit like broken octaves, like actually literally octaves which are just slightly broken, instead of even 16th notes. I know that's kind of a solution that I came to for some parts, and you can hear other even great pianists uh, doing that as well in, in recordings. And actually, I think it can be quite effective in certain parts, so that's one thing you can kind of do to release the tension a little bit. Another thing that really helps is to interpret these waves very melodically. The 16th note motive in broken octaves, that's really the melody here. All the chords and stuff that you're playing in the other hand are really just... Uh, support. So really, it should not sound like a technical exercise. It should really sound very, very melodic, very expressive as Leander is struggling with the ocean here. And I think in general, people usually play this part too fast and too robotically, too straight. So that's just my own uh, little bit of advice. And then after a huge buildup, we do reach the opening theme. That opening long note theme comes back in a new form combined with this new broken chord octave thing. And it's a really incredible moment where you can tell it's, it is really life and death struggle at this moment.
it seems that he reaches shore again this time, and we get a new theme. We get that love theme that I was talking about before, this theme right here. This theme again is going to come back several more times in ever new shapes and always more and more beautiful and, and striking. So then we get another appearance of Hero's theme that we heard in the kind of exposition section. And here it's much more expanded, it's much more passionate, much warmer, much more personal. It really sounds like totally new music. Again, the accompaniment might remind you of that third uh, constellation or the Chopin D flat nocturne. It's a little bit of a similar kind of texture. Now, going back to kind of the structural technical element, now we're actually in the related major key. Our home key of B minor, we're now in D major. So again, this kind of makes sense as being a starting point uh, for something like a development section. It would be very common to have the second theme in a sonata form be in D major. Uh, so usually you wouldn't have both B minor and the dominant F sharp major and then also D major, but Liszt is kind of doing He's actually found a way to combine both types of harmonic motions here. Uh, normally you'd only have one of those in a sonata form, but it still works for kind of a sonata form area. So the, the second night with all the waves and everything started in F sharp minor, so it started in the minor dominant. It kind of all fits together. We're still fairly close to home as far as the, the key world goes. So for the fourth night, it kind of starts with what I might call a false recapitulation because we hear the opening theme again in a very similar setting to how it was at the opening of, of the piece. So as you recall, the opening was like this. And then on the fourth night we get this texture. It is very similar, but at the same time, the differences are just as striking. It's much faster in the left hand now. It's louder. The right hand is, is thicker, the way it's written with chords. We're also in the wrong key. We're basically in the key of G sharp minor at this point, and we're going to go pretty far afield. We're going to go into C minor before coming back towards E minor and, and the home key of B minor. So this is the climax of the story at this point. This is the true struggle, the biggest storm of all. And it's pretty striking. You can even see the exact moment where Leander is overwhelmed by the waves and drowns. You'll notice also that in this climax, the triplet motive from the beginning of the third night comes back in a greatly amplified version. <laughs> It's just remarkable how almost cinematic, but definitely operatic some of this is. So right after that chromatic motive going down to the bottom of the keyboard where Leander drowns, we can almost hear the motive of Hero kind of calling out, or trying to find him in, in the storm.
The writing here also has a very recitative-like quality, which I really associate with some of the recitative-like passages in Wagner music dramas. And then we get the love theme again, this time in B major. So now as far as keys go, this is kind of where we start to get a recapitulation. The idea of a recapitulation of sorts, because we're going to get hero's motive in B major, and we're also going to get that opening theme transformed into B major. So it's really a, an amazing moment when that happens. So here's the new version of the love theme, which has some kind of incredible nostalgia and sadness this time in the way that the piano writing has been amplified. And then next we get Hero's motive one more time. This time again, it's very, very different from its previous incarnations. The first two times it was kind of innocent. The third time it had this more kind of generous, passionate, very human quality to it. This time it's more kind of uh, frozen and disembodied. It feels almost like distant bells or, so, or something like that. And it's very important, I think, here that Liszt actually doesn't write any dynamic uh, indications until the very end of this section, and I think it really should be played almost without nuance in this kind of frozen, distant way. So my own interpretation, I do feel that when the love theme comes again in this new form, there are many uh, depictions of Hero finding Leander on the shore. This is one version that the myth oftentimes takes. One of my favorite might be this sketch by Alexander Runsman, Scottish artist. It's only a, kind of a pencil drawing, but it's it's very, very moving and, and powerful to me. I think it captures this, this moment really well, and it really relates to this music uh, in my imagination. So there's this moment, I think, in the love theme where she finds Hero's body, then this kind of disembodied version of, of Hero's theme where she's just kind of in shock and kind of frozen there. And then we get the transfiguration of the opening theme, the theme of the ocean, of the power of nature, the implacable power of nature, at least in my interpretation. Uh, let's hear them side by side. The first time that this theme occurs at the very beginning of the piece. transformation. Again, for me, the, the drama here is so vivid. You can almost hear in the music hero seeing the ocean again, only now the ocean is, is calm. And now also perhaps in her mind, she can feel that it's, it has the power to reunite her with Leander. In most versions of the, of the myth, a hero throws herself into the ocean from the top of, of the tower of the, the shrine of Aphrodite. And there are some versions of the myth, I believe, where she's lifted up by Poseidon or some which are more prosaic, just to have her being washed up on the shore in an embrace with, with the dead Leander as well. When people find them together, they put them in a lover's tomb, and they become part of history. So you'll 
you'll remember also that in, in Tristan, there's a very similar kind of ending, uh, Isolde's Liebestod, which she sings to the dead Tristan, and then she also falls down in an embrace and dies. We assume she dies on, on Tristan's body. And there's this idea that the death is actually has this transfiguring power and can reunite the lovers. So whatever you think about that, it's a very powerful theme, a very common theme for romantic artists. So this transfiguration of the opening uh, motive is repeated several times with one very brief callback to that love theme, but in a very new form, a very a mysterious kind of reharmonization. And it ends with this passage in alternating octaves marked Precipitato, which I've always assumed is actually Hero throwing herself into the ocean from the top of the tower. But instead of having a tragic ending, this is seen as some kind of an, an apotheosis, an apotheosis of love and dedication. So we get two final statements of this opening theme transformed into B major. And here there is, of course, again, this kind of suggestion of, of water and the waves. And Liszt writes this absolutely iconic version where there are these huge ascending scales and you have to trade the melody between the right and left hand as you play them. So again, before the kind of motive of the ocean and of the water was was a motive, you remember, that rose and also fell. But here, actually, it's just rising. So this kind of apotheosis of Hero and Leander. It's worth noting here, actually, that there is an alternative version to this passage in which Liszt actually uses the chords, which you heard before in the third night, the first kind of struggle with the ocean, uh, instead of the scales. I think this is a clear case where his ideal musical version was the Ossia passage. There's several other places in his music where he puts the, actually the, probably the ideal version, but the more complex and subtle technical version in the Ossia and uses a more straightforward version, which perhaps more pianists would have found conducive to a successful performance in the main text. But there is uh, some indication that he probably preferred the Ossia versions and it's uh, seems obviously to be the most effective version. Then there's also the question of the ending of this piece as well, because at this point, the manuscript and the first edition differ enormously. In Liszt's manuscript, there is at this point a very dramatic, very virtuosic coda, quite fast, quite loud, in which all the motives from before in the piece are combined together. We hear a lot of different motives from the ocean, and also a hero's motive kind of reaches this high point of excitement. Somewhere in between the manuscript going to print, uh, Liszt decided that this was not quite the right way to end, and he inserted a much shorter, much more thoughtful, slower, quieter ending. To my mind, one of the great endings in all music. And actually, for this video, I was originally even going to try learning the original ending, but I couldn't quite muster the enthusiasm to do so. I just... Uh, don't find it to be that convincing. But there are some people out there who have done it, and I even linked one performance in the description box of one that I particularly liked. Pianist who actually treats it in kind of a free way and did something very beautiful with it. Most of the recordings I've heard of, of this original ending are just a little bit too playing into the virtuosic aspect of it, and it comes off sounding kind of pat and empty. I think that sometimes can be a problem with Liszt's endings. I don't know if this is something that you might have felt as well, but in some of the Hungarian Rhapsodies, for example, the piece will be so detailed in its writing and so wonderful and inspired sounding, and then the ending will sometimes sound a little bit kind of pat and easy, almost generic. And I oftentimes feel that perhaps Liszt would have left the full inspiration for those sort of endings, endings to the moment, to the inspiration of the moment, and he just kind of wrote down some kind of simple uh, solution just to end the piece for the printed version. But that might not have been what he really would have played. And I get a little bit of that feeling here as well, uh, also in the original ending to the B minor sonata, which also originally ended in a huge 
blaze of glory, but then Liszt changed at the last moment to have a much more mystical, quiet kind of ending. So in the revised ending, uh, we have one last very tender look at Hero's motive, now marked andantino, so it, it should be played noticeably slower than before and with much more of a, of a kind of a heartfelt a lingering on each note. And then there's one last little nod towards the love theme as well in the last couple bars. And this wonderful holding on to this kind of suspension, the G-sharp resolving to the F-sharp. He holds it longer than you even think is possible. You might expect the ending actually to sound... Uh, to go like this based on our built-in expectations from hearing lots of music. But instead, Liszt extends it even a little bit further. So it's a, it's a very, very touching kind of farewell that's just, you know, you, d you don't want to let go of. And I, I feel it perfectly matches the, the feeling of this, of this story and this legend. So there you have it. Lists, Blood, number two in B minor. And the complete performance, of course, is coming up. So thank you for staying with me all the way. It was certainly a long journey, but it's one of the, one of the great pieces of the 19th century, in my opinion. So I never get tired of this piece. It was actually kind of interesting working on it this time because uh, the last time I played this piece was for one of my very first concerts when I was about 13 years old, I think, 13 or 14 years old. I remember that this was the piece de resistance on on one of those very first concerts that I did. And I hadn't played the piece since then, you know, and until now when I just brought it back and practiced it again. So it was fascinating to see what things were the same, how my perspective had changed, how I felt differently about it now. But it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful piece that really repays all of the effort you put into it. Coming back to it this time, I'm just struck by how timeless the piece really is. So definitely a piece I'll be wanting to play again and again now that it's come back into my repertoire. So thank you again for watching. Um, please do support the channel. Uh, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. You can support me on Patreon as well, www.patreon.com forward slash independent pianist if you like this content and you want to see more. Thank you to all my current uh, Patreon supporters. I really, really appreciate your taking the time and money to help keep this channel going. Uh, so until next time, I'll leave you now. This is Cole Anderson signing off, and here comes the complete performance of Liszt's Ballade Number no. 2 in B minor. <laughs>